Some people say he wants to re-establish Stalin's empire of the immediate post-World War II era. Some people say he wants to re-establish Catherine the Great's empire or Peter the Great's empire. Why knowledge matters. Dr. Ken Fraser, welcome back to the show. And glad to be here. Thank you. I hope everything is going well in beautiful Australia, down under, I should say. You really have deep insight in when it comes to international relations. And the Russia and the Ukrainian conflict is really very staggering. And it really brings back so many terrible memories, especially for Europe. You know, after mm. post-World War, the Cold War, and now this terrible um, a war uh, which is uh, has huge implication for for really in anyone let alone like the human cost it actually entails does it make sense from a poorly geopolitical point of view what putin is doing from a russian perspective well, you can't really make a decision about uh, whether something's a good idea or whether it makes sense without first understanding where the decision is coming from and why that decision is being made. And there's a lot of speculation about what's going on in, in Vladimir Putin's mind about him wanting to re-establish the Tsarist empire uh, of all the Russias, uh, which uh, certainly would include Ukraine. Uh, some people say he wants to re-establish Stalin's empire of uh, the immediate post-World War II era. Some people say he wants to re-establish Catherine the Great's empire or Peter the Great's empire. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I don't know whether we can look inside Vladimir Putin's mind. What typically happens in these situations is that whoever's going to do the invasion brings up every argument they can possibly imagine to justify it. It's very exactly the same thing happened when the US invaded uh, Iraq in 2003. So it's difficult to disentangle which ones he actually means and which ones are um, just window dressing or some way to make a, uh, an excuse for invading. So whether Vladimir Putin wants to re-establish Catherine the Great's empire or Stalin's Soviet empire, it doesn't really matter. You don't need that. Um, you only need to look at a map and see that he, as from his point of view, he's surrounded by NATO countries um, or at least surrounded by Western-backed or Western-supported countries, not so much in Central Asia, I guess, in Kazakhstan, um, but still there's competition there as to whether... Uh, you know, who's going to hold the most uh, influence in that region. But in Eastern Europe, certainly uh, with the Baltic states and Poland and uh, some of the um, Balkan states uh, belonging to NATO. So Moldova doesn't belong, but the other, uh, Romania, Bulgaria. Um, and Ukraine was wavering on the side. They, were, they want to join the uh, European Union. They want to join NATO. And one of the reasons they definitely want to join NATO is to protect themselves from uh, Russian uh, expansionism. So Putin's got in before uh, that was able to happen and said, you know, he, he wanted Ukraine to declare neutrality from NATO and he wanted NATO to guarantee that they wouldn't uh, incorporate Ukraine, which NATO naturally refused to do. So you don't actually need to think that uh, Vladimir Putin's gone crazy uh, to to see why he's doing this. You know, whether it actually makes sense uh, or whether it's a good idea is a whole other question. It really, and, and the answer to that is it doesn't. Um, there's no need for Russia to invade Ukraine. It's just they benefit nothing from it, really. Uh, Certainly the Russian people and the Russian um, democracy, not that there's much of a democracy left now, I, I don't think, but uh, after the Cold War, but, but it doesn't makes no sense for Russia as a whole to do that. Russia would be much, much better off if they uh, increased their democratic uh, aspects, if they held proper elections, if Vladimir Putin had stepped down in 2008 after he served his two terms, 
um, and they had uh, proper political parties and, and the kind of thing that we, we in the democratic countries, Canada and Australia, the US, would see as legitimate um, democratic functioning. There's no reason at all why Russia shouldn't have come to some kind of arrangement with NATO or even joined. There was some talk early on of them actually joining NATO or joining the European Union. Uh, I think it's very easy and safe to say that the Russian people would have benefited much more from that than what they are fr from this horrendous, brutal, criminal uh, invasion that's going on at the moment. So you can, does it make sense? Well, it makes sense if you uh, want to establish a sphere of influence and if you want to, make, want to make Russia into a great power that everybody fears and it strides the world stage in history. I suppose it makes sense from that point of view. But in every other way, it makes no sense at all. It's absolutely horrendous. Putin, as some would argue, although others strongly disagree, who say that, well, Putin is out of his mind. Do you think that this is a credible argument for what he's doing now? Um, it depends what you mean by out of, it, out of his mind, of course. That's a rather uh, broad um, idea. Whether he's got any sort of clinical uh, mental problems, you know, it's possible. People who get into those positions where they're completely uh, all-powerful, if they have ultimate power uh, over millions, hundreds of millions of people, uh, huge land, they've got enormous uh, uh, military power. And Putin, of course, has thousands of nuclear weapons that he can use any time he wants. Um, and people who are incredible, single people who are um, uh, immensely powerful, but there's this syndrome that can happen to them where they are not uh, keen to accept any advice or information that doesn't accord with their worldview. And so, and so they end up, even if they might not intend to, just they, uh, over time they gradually sack or sideline the people, anybody who disagrees with them, and at the same time they promote or allow in people who reinforce their power and who reinforce their uh, worldview and their view of themselves as uniquely powerful, uniquely sort of fated or destined uh, to stride the world stage and, and get their names in the history books. Ambition is a funny thing. When you, when you first uh, achieve your first ambition, well, you don't rest satisfied. You, um, many people just think up a new ambition, a new uh, goal that, that's even bigger and wider and you know, more extraordinary. So they're never satisfied, uh, some people, not all. Um, but Putin, and Putin certainly seems to have been, um, seems to have gradually over time, he's established that sort of system around him, uh, which is he crazy? Well, yeah, it's, I don't know that you'd say he's clinically crazy, but it could well be that he's deluded about a lot of things, partly because he's living his own dreams, um, which we don't really know. We can't look into his mind. Um, we can, as I said before, we can see what he says, but that's not necessarily any indication of what's actually going on in his mind. Um, what he's trying to do is establish... Uh, uh, a buffer zone, but even it's not even a buffer zone. Kiev could easily be said to be part of Russia. Indeed, the we get the name Russia from the uh, Scandinavian traders who came down the Volga River and um, and the Dnieper River and uh, landed in Kiev, and they they were uh, what they called the Kievan Rus. And so that's where we get the name Russia. So the originally that uh, he, he's got a claim to say the original territory of, of what you, we think of as Russia includes Ukraine, but that's all hundreds of years ago, you know, thousand years ago. Uh, so it's ridiculous to make claims on that basis about what's happening currently. Um, so he's got these uh, several aims there. He wants to incorporate Ukraine into what's traditionally or some sort of historical uh, Russia, and he wants to establish a buffer. They're slightly conflicting claims because in one, in one 
if he wants a buffer, he needs to establish a new state or a puppet regime in, in Ukraine. If he wants to incorporate Ukraine into Russia, um, then he'll still just be moving his border up towards the NATO countries anyway. So is he crazy? Well, I don't know about that. Is he deluded? He might well be because people might not be telling him the truth. Um, and, and is he ambitious? He doesn't need to be crazy uh, to be wanting to do, to achieve these aims. So there's another question as to whether he will actually achieve his aims there, which uh, is highly doubtful. Do, so, you think, do you think that the sanction they might help or is it ultimately counterproductive that he will just look for another and potentially bigger and bigger and stronger party such as China in the future, which is mm. also maybe not the very helpful if you look at the, from a Western point of view. What do you think about these sanctions? Sanctions are a uh, uncertain weapon. I think it's a very good thing that uh, they, they, well, parts of the world, at least the Western world, you might say that the NATO countries have uh, shown a united front um, and the, it's undoubtedly the sanctions, the kind of sanctions that have been imposed on Russia, including the banning from the SWIFT uh, international payment system are going to hurt the Russian economy very in a in a major way. Now, whether the decision makers and there, there appears to be only one decision maker, uh, Mr. Putin himself, President Putin, uh, Putin, I should say, uh, there's some debate as to whether Putin himself will suffer because of the sanctions. That's highly doubtful. Russia is a huge um, area, and he can no doubt he can get anything he wants that is already in Russia. Um, so, but what it might happen is that uh, the people suffer. So the people around Putin, the oligarchs and the people, the very, very rich and powerful people who have supported Putin in the past might stop supporting him because they're more interested in money uh, than they are in glory or geopolitical or geostrategic affairs. Um, so that's certainly, uh, that's probably the aim of it. And that's why they're targeting the sanctions in a very narrow way uh, against those people. Some of the, some of the banning from the SWIFT payments thing is, will cause pain and suffering for the whole country. Um, banning imports, banning exports, that sort of thing will have a, an effect. And, but the, the difficulty is it will make people suffer. But whether that means they turn against Putin or not is another question altogether they might blame the West. So, for example, in North Korea, um, people suffer terribly because of uh, its isolation from the world, but the leadership can very easily say, well, we're not suffering because of anything we've done, we're suffering because the Americans are leading this uh, uh, isolation. In Cuba, it was the same thing for many, many years, um, where it was isolated, but not because it was, they were suffering economically, but it wasn't really because of a problem with the government in Cuba. It was a problem that uh, every, the Americans wouldn't let anybody trade with them, and that makes it very difficult. So sanctions are, I mean, yes, it is good to show a united front. It is, I think President Biden has done an absolutely marvellous job, a really incredibly clever and uh, with the letting out of um, intelligence assessments in the lead up to the invasion. And since then, in building a, a very strong coalition of people who are willing, countries who are willing to uh, change their policy to punish Russia, including Germany. Germany is a very big uh, issue. They've radically, um, Chancellor Schultz seems to have radically changed German policy with regard to defence spending. Uh, and they, they're included in the Russians. You know, Germany is a very big economy. They, they buy a lot of, did buy a lot of gas and uh, uh, fuel from uh, Russia. So that's a big thing. The German economy, economy will suffer. The other thing, of course, is that uh, it's not only the people in the area who are going to suffer because um, Ukraine and Russia between them grow a huge amount of the world's grain. So people all over the world, particularly in Africa and other places, in, in South Asia and other places where food 
is a is a significant part of the household budget. Um, they are going to suffer from because of this because there won't be grain and food prices will go up. We in the affluent countries like Canada and Australia probably won't suffer too much from that. We'll complain about our grocery bills going up, but it won't be that terrible. But in other places in the world, people will starve because they can't afford food. Uh, so that's that's a horrendous thing too. I mean, this is also a thing, right? For for some, maybe for some of us, it's it's okay if the food price, even in our countries, go up. But if you have like a family, three, four kids, I think yes. it has a huge impact. And I think that's often also time get, it gets easily forgotten. And you think like, yeah, I think all really uh, suffer. So uh, it's definitely not something that, uh, you know, it's easy to say, well, it's a good thing or it's a bad thing. I think it's, it's always a double-edged sword. Now, mm. How, what is your assessment when it comes to the role of weapons of mass destruction in this conflict? Does it actually help in order to de-escalate to some extent, at least, the conflict? Or Well, that is, that is a very interesting question. Um, so you can try it by, you can approach it by thinking of the counterfactual. What if there were no... Uh, weapons of mass destruction. If we have, take a hypothetical situation where there were no nuclear weapons, ICBMs and other instruments of uh, Armageddon, then it would be pretty straightforward, actually. NATO uh, and the NATO states in the area, Poland, Germany, and the US uh, would also contribute. And there's really no doubt whatsoever who would win a conflict like that. It might be bloody, it might be difficult, it certainly would be expensive, um, but the NATO forces would have, I won't say they would have no problem, but they would have a, a job that they could do to expel Russian forces from Ukraine. At the moment, they simply can't do that. Well, that's can't might be too strong a word. They could try, but uh, Putin has this card up his sleeve that he's willing to threaten complete destruction of the entire world. Um, and, and that makes it very difficult. And it, it makes it, as Joe Biden's been saying, and frankly, I've been agreeing with him quite uh, strongly, that uh, it's crazy. It would be a very, very bad idea for US or NATO forces to engage Russian forces in actual combat. doesn't mean we can't support, uh, not we, because Australia is obviously not part of NATO, but it doesn't mean NATO can't support the uh, resistance to the invasion in Ukraine, and they are, and the Ukrainians are doing a, a highly effective job of um, stopping the Russian advances, which is, you know, that's been somewhat of a surprise to a lot of people, and particularly to Vladimir Putin. We might talk a bit about corruption in that regard. Uh, and again, the idea of the thing about surrounding yourself with yes people is is dangerous. Um, but the so so the nuclear weapons uh, do have a very big effect on the battlefield. They ra they limit the um, actions that NATO can take to oppose Russia. They can't actually shoot at any Russians. Now, having said all that, we really you have to stay, take a step back and say, well, hang on a minute. This means that we're not uh, willing to do the kind of brinkmanship that Vladimir Putin is willing to do. He's willing to say, if you attack me, I'm going to blow the whole world up and take you all with me as I go down. Um, and, and because he's willing to do that, he, he can pretend to be a madman. So you, there's this, they call it the madman theory of geostrategy. Uh, Richard Nixon used to do it. He used to pretend that he was crazy, and and uh, it, it, he invented the term. How about I think. Donald? Tr uh, how about Donald Trump? It's also to some extent, I guess, it was also yeah, a lot of yeah. we're afraid about his temperament. Well, that's Donald right. Trump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think there's a better case to make that Trump himself is indeed crazy, <laughs> but uh, that doesn't make him any less dangerous. But Vladimir Putin might well be pre pretending to be crazy. So all the everything you hear about him, oh, he wants to, he's got all these crazy dreams of being in uh, uh, re-establishing the Russian Empire, and the man's a lunatic, and 
all of that actually plays into his hands because it makes it more dangerous. Obviously, we won't, don't want to tempt fate by taunting this lunatic in the Kremlin. Um, but, you know, more recently I've been thinking, well, it's really uh, almost unimaginably horrendous situation in Ukraine at the moment, and it's only going to get worse. We might talk about the strategic situation on the ground. Um, but it, it's looking as though it's going to get very, very horrible indeed for the Ukrainian people. Um, and so Western leaders have to make this calculation. Okay, are we willing to make, take that risk? Are we willing to go in and establish a no-fly zone, for example, which would involve engaging uh, Russian air assets, but it would also involve engaging Russian anti-air, ground uh, surface-to-air uh, weapons and weapon systems that are actually in Russian territory. So it's not just about stopping them from coming into Ukraine. You have to attack their S-300 anti-aircraft, uh, ground-based anti-aircraft uh, systems in Russia. So that would be a very, very risky thing to do um, because that's the point at which Putin might say, well, they're you know, attacking me. But of course, he must know uh, that as the minute he launches any kind of a substantial nuclear strike, he will immediately uh, cause Russia itself to be obliterated from the map. He'd certainly be um, making that a higher possibility. So would, would he be willing to do that? He must know that he himself would be in extreme danger in those circumstances, although he does have bunkers in, in the Ural Mountains um, and in other places that we probably don't know about where he can hide from uh, a nuclear blast. But honestly, it's pretty difficult to hide from a nuclear blast, especially when there's 300 of them across the length and breadth of the country. So would he be willing to do that? Well, the problem, part of the problem is when he gets, when people get into that position, they, it's hard for them to retire uh, because they're likely to be killed or, or tried and imprisoned or something when they lose power instead of just quietly retiring to his estate on the Black Sea, which might be the best thing. You know, it's, it's, it's not justice. Uh, that's for sure, but it can be peace. You can make a deal with people like that, as they did with Idi Amin back in the 70s, where they say, okay, you back off and we'll allow you to have a comfortable retirement um, wherever you like. Uh, that's unusual, though. Usually you get shot or tried or imprisoned or, you know, like Slobodan Milosevic, you die in prison in The Hague. So he's probably wanting to avoid that. He's got limited room for manoeuvre, that's the thing. So far, you would say the Western world responded very cautiously, but also very reasonably, given the situation. Mm. Yes, I think Joe Biden has played it like an absolute master on the stage, he's, on the world stage. He's done an incredibly uh, good job of going just far enough, but not quite far too far. Uh, to provoke a response. Big questions remain, though, regarding China and Russia and uh, Russia and India. China and India. Uh, India has not explicitly condemned the invasion. Uh, India has a very large, I think it's 70% of their armed, of their uh, gear, their kit that they have in their armed services is from Russia. Um, so they have a, a strong relationship with them and they have not come out explicitly against the invasion. China seems to have cooled off a bit. They were developing a strong relationship with Russia, but they seem to, I think Xi Jinping's been a bit shocked by this invasion and he's going, whoa, we don't want to have anything to do with that. Um, so backing off a little bit, but but India is a, could be a big problem because it's, uh, you know, on the surface, ostensibly it's supposed to be a democracy um, it's in the quad relationship with Australia and the US and Japan, very important defence relationship. So uh, if they are not on board with uh, what's happening in Ukraine, that puts some strain on that relationship in the quad, particularly been between India and the US. So that's, you know, pretty tricky. That's a nasty situation. So the, uh, what I'm getting to is that it's not universal. So not, it's not the case that every great power in the world has condemned this appalling invasion. Um, 
and it's not the case that the, everybody's on board with the sanctions and things like that. So, and as they go on longer and people in Germany start freezing to death in the winter time, um, that will be a problem. The, the US, they do have reserves and the US has released some of its re reserves of oil uh, and gas, I think, to uh, help with that sort of thing. But it, when it comes around to winter and people are uh, freezing to death, then they might be protesting about the sanctions and saying, we need Russian gas to keep our homes. Um, so, you know, it's, it's difficult. The future, well, you can never predict the future, but this moment of unanimity against uh, the Russians might not last for very long. It fades out of the news when they bombed um, Mariupol and Kyiv and Kharkiv into rubble and people are just seeing pictures that don't look anything like them. One of the things that happens is when people can see streams of refugees that look like them, so people in the West who are, and they see people who are wearing similar clothes, who are groomed the same, their same skin colour, uh, they understand the religion, um, that uh, makes them much more sympathetic. And when they see buildings, when they see architecture and, and uh, of cities that are intact, that have shopping malls and all the kinds of things that they're used to seeing in their neighbourhood, then they are empathetic and they're you know, outraged if those people are suffering. But once the city's been bombed into a shell and it looks like Aleppo or it looks like what Grozny looked like, uh, when the war was on then, and all they, all they can see is wrecked buildings and, and walls standing, that are, uh, the remains of uh, apartment buildings and things, then the people in the West, in the US and in Western Europe, are, are going to identify with that less and less and less. It will fall down and down and down, the newsworthiness uh, stakes, you know, over, over not very long, generally, you know, don't want to make predictions again, but uh, it doesn't take long usually for people to get distracted by something else. We are currently in Australia, we're all concerned about um, the funeral of a cricketer. So um, it's difficult for people then to be to suffer. You see what I mean? To make sacrifices. They're willing to make sacrifices to help people who look like them. Uh, but when they don't look, at, look at, like them and they ruin cities, then they're less willing to make immediate sacrifices. Dr. Ken Fraser, thank you so much for sharing your important insights. Always a pleasure to have you. Yes, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pity we're talking about such grim uh, subject matter, but it's very Great to be able to contribute to the public knowledge about these things. Thank you. Dr. Ken Fraser. <laughs>